The assassination of an Iraqi militia leader in a drone attack has thrown light on the implications and the repercussions of, the, of Israel's war on Gaza in that country. What is happening in Iraq? Elections are due in the United Kingdom this year and both the Conservative and Labour parties are making all kinds of announcements, although there is widespread dissatisfaction against both. What are the prospects of both these parties? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Since October 7th, Iraq has seen a number of attacks on US bases by militia groups which are in solidarity with the people of Palestine. The US has responded severely with attacks as well. Recently, a drone attack in Baghdad killed the leader of a popular militia and wounded others, leading to outrage in the country as the United States is blamed. The US continues to maintain around 2,500 troops in Iraq despite opposition by all key political forces and demands that they be withdrawn. We go to Abdul to understand the situation in the country. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So, uh, there have been continuous uh, actions happening in Iraq actually since October 7th, both from the side of various resistance forces, various militias and from the side of the United States and Israel. So, could you maybe take us through what has been the latest event, probably one of the more severe attacks that has taken place and we can talk about the context after. Well, on Thursday afternoon, uh, there was a drone attack uh, in eastern Baghdad where the uh, popular mobilization forces, the Hast al-Sabi, the semi-official militia group in Iraq had its headquarters. And in that drone attack, at least four uh, hostile Sabi, uh, you can say soldiers, members were killed, including one of the top commanders, uh, uh, Mustaq al-Shabi or Abu Taqwa, as, as, as he was popularly known. He, uh, uh, so there were four people killed and six others were injured. And of course, that has led to a large uh, scale uh, uh, popular resistance. In fact, there was a huge uh, gathering uh, when the, his funeral procession uh, was held uh, on Thursday evening. And it has led to uh, strong reactions coming from all government officials in Iraq, including the Prime Minister uh, Shial Sudani, who basically said that this attack is basically a violation of uh, Iraqi sovereignty. And this basically also means, uh, Iraqi forces commander-in-chief said, that this is a violation of the agreements which the Iraq had uh, signed with the U.S. when uh, the, the U.S. forces uh, deployment in the country, the nature of it was changed from combat to training and assistance mission. So uh, all of these reactions, uh, strong reactions have come uh, following the killing of uh, Abu Taqwa. And this basically reminds uh, the killing of uh, uh, IRGC uh, commander in 2020, uh, uh, Qasim Soleimani, and uh, Abu Mandi al Mohandis, again PMF uh, commander at the time. So uh, uh, this is the latest which has happened, as you rightly point, in the uh, e events which basically, or you can say attacks and counterattacks, which started post October 7 uh, following the Israeli offensive, Israeli war in Gaza. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, Abdul, could you maybe also take us to the general political situation in Iraq? What is sort of, you know, what have the, the responses been? What has been the uh, position of the Iraqi government, other sections, as far as Israel's brutal offensive is concerned? Well, uh, both pop, uh, people in Iraq and the Iraqi government has strongly, uh, you can say, stood, have, sta uh, sta uh, have taken stand against uh, the war in uh, Gaza. Of course, uh, there had been mobilizations since October 7, uh, where sometimes millions of people have participated uh, denouncing uh, Israeli occupation, uh, the genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. And Iraqi government has continued to basically demand ceasefire. Uh, all, In fact, it has been part of the Arab uh, initiative, uh, Arab Islamic initiative, which basically led to uh, delegation moving towards different parts of the world, demanding, mobilizing, you can say, uh, for ceasefire in Gaza and uh, also mobilization for, mobilizing for uh, the, a permanent solution to the conflict uh, or the, you can say, end of occupation of Palestine. Uh, so that has been the official response. As far as the, the militias are concerned, the militias 
have been take have been basically uh, declared you can say a war uh, as a part of the axis of resistance uh, hezbollah in lebanon uh, houthis in yemen and other pop- uh, militias in different parts of the region uh, with hats al sabi the popular mobilization forces in iraq have basically taken a stand against the war in iraq in sorry in palestine and they have basically targeted particularly the Isra- uh, us bases in different parts of the region uh, uh, as per the records at least the us bases uh, in iraq and syria have been attacked at least 118 times since october 7 uh, of course they have uh, they have declared that since us is the basic enabler of uh, uh, the israeli genocide in gaza by providing weapons billions of dollars of weapons uh, the ammunition which is used by israel uh, uh, to bomb uh, palestinians in gaza uh, uh, and diplomatic support uh, basically using veto repeatedly in the united nations security council to basically prevent any kind of attempts to kind of pass a resolution demanding immediate ceasefire in gaza so since us has been uh, playing an active role in the war uh, in gaza therefore it is it is a party and therefore uh, targeting its bases in all over uh, the region becomes a legitimate uh, uh, leg- becomes legitimate and with that position uh, pmf has been carrying out carrying out attack against the us bases um if if uh, and this also basically uh, is clubbed with their long term opposition to any foreign military presence in the country and that is precisely what uh, sudanis reaction the iraqi prime minister reaction was that uh, uh, on friday uh, while addressing a popular gathering uh, he basically claimed that his government has initiated a, a process through which the us forces or all the international forces the international coalition force as it is called officially will would be withdrawn with a time uh, timeline uh, 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 you can say formal timeline so this is uh, has this has been the reaction so iraqi government and iraqi people have opposed the palestine war against palestinians in gaza and they continue to do so right abdul thank you so much for that update thousands of junior doctors in the uk are continuing the six day strike but this was not really on the agenda of labor party leader and opposition leader of course keir starmer who made his new year speech from bristol on january 4th in the speech starmer called for project hope that sets the tone for labor's pitch as elections are expected to be held later this year but lacking any clear policy blueprints or promises working class groups have expressed disappointment meanwhile prime minister rishi sunak has brushed aside talks of an early election even as he's on campaign mode after back to back defeats in bipol bipols last year we go to anish to understand the situation anish you talked on the show before about the british junior doctors strike the reasons but today we are talking about the larger political situation how the ruling class the ruling elite is responding to many of these issues let's first take the case of the labor party leader keir starmer uh, favored by many to win in the upcoming elections and he's of course announcing a lot of proposals announcing a lot of visions etc etc so but what is this vision of keir starmer what really is he talking about uh well, let's begin with the fact that uh, there are no what we see from this whatever he calls project hope uh, uh which he claims is intended to bring out uh the, the poor uh, sections of uh, britain uh, out of you know the kind of hopelessness that uh, the tory administration had given under different prime ministers obviously in the last uh, about uh, one and a half decade uh but the issue is that he doesn't give any concrete promises as well and that is uh the biggest concern right now because obviously uh, starmer is somebody who is leading uh, not because he is particularly remarkable but because he is, uh, because the tory government right now uh, are pretty much uh one of you know are doing one of the worst uh when it comes to managing an economy that shouldn't have been this worse off uh they have let the cost of living spiral to a point where uh, you know the united kingdom is one of the worst off right now uh in the western world when it comes to inflation when it comes to the cost of living and so on and so forth and it really is affecting the bottom line with poverty actually nearly doubling uh over the past few years and this is something that has not been addressed uh on top of that we are seeing the government 
uh, not investing in actually ramping up the healthcare sector or for that matter, uh, industries and definitely all the, uh, you know, all the promises that Brexit had offered uh, didn't come to fruition because, you know, the Tory plan for Brexit was essentially just to keep migrants away and has nothing to do with economic revival. And the thing is, Kai Starmer uh, talks about uh, emissions, talks about bringing emissions to zero by 2030, but he has he's no longer talking about uh, the 28 billion pound uh, annual fund that the Labour Party had promised uh, last year uh, if they came to power. And it was one of the talking points in the convention, but it is no longer part of uh, his speech. He doesn't talk about, he, in fact, he actually talks about uh, you know, uh, prioritizing, uh, keeping the uh, the balance of the budget in, rather than actually bringing in more or finding more ways to raise revenues. He has not talked about, uh, you know, uh, cutting down taxes on the middle and lower income groups. He is not talking about uh, how to fund or even about funding or allowing for uh, greater investments in the healthcare sector. He is giving promises. But he is now uh, distancing himself from the kind of promises, very concrete promises, that was uh, pretty much a result of, uh, you know, a left-wing labor mobilization, trade union mobilization. And that is being roundly called up right now by uh, people within the labor itself who are talking that change cannot be something that can be just, uh, you know, given, uh, uh, that can be just said. It has It requires concrete policy uh, measures that the Labour Party really needs to take up, but Starmer is right now not intent uh, to actually taking up many of these issues. Raninish, uh, now going to the other end of the spectrum, the Conservatives seem to be in disarray. They have had multiple Prime Ministers, none of them really doing the trick. Rishi Sunak doesn't seem to have worked either. Yeah, Rishi Sunak is probably one of the worst performers uh, if you, uh, you know, discount the previous one uh, but uh, nevertheless uh, he is uh, you know one of the least popular uh, prime ministers that britain has seen in decades right now and uh, that has primarily to do with the fact that sunak has been part of previous administration and was at the forefront of many of its failures and those failures are coming back to bite him right now as the prime minister he hasn't been able to revive or regain any kind of confidence and we have seen over the past year uh, how by-elections after by-elections, they have just lost seeds, seeds that they held for, you know, a decade or more than a decade. Sometimes, uh, you know, they seeds that they never lost since the 70s even. And it's uh, in all of these cases, uh, even though the turnout was low and you cannot really, you know, use that as the gauge of what the national mood would be, but it clearly shows that the that the conservatives have lost the plot right now. And, you know, the attempt to bring back, uh, a, you know, pr previous uh, leaders of the party that can actually, uh, in the hopes that that can actually revive any kind of confidence among at least its conservative voters, uh, clearly shows that it is, uh, uh, you know, it's quite desperate. Uh, they have been campaigning for about the past two months right now. Uh, there are, they have been on campaign mode, essentially speaking, after the last uh, by-election route, uh, but it hasn't really gained any kind of confidence. And in that sense, if you look at it, uh, there has been sig significant backlash from the working class movement that uh, the conservatives have not been able to, uh, you know, stamp out uh, no matter how much they tried, no matter how much they've tried to break strikes, including the current junior uh, doctor strike where the labor is trying to use employers to get them to, uh, you know, cut strikes uh, short, but that is not working either. On the other hand, we also do not have the labor coming out very forthrightly when it comes to supporting these strikers and supporting these work, uh, working class mobilization, because obviously he sees himself as uh, the person who can somehow manage, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the capitalist class interest with uh, whatever little working class uh, facade that the Labour Party right now has in its leadership, at least. And that is really uh, creating a situation where the voters are essentially choosing between uh, you know, the really bad from the not so bad. And it's, uh, it, and it clearly shows even in the polls, like uh, 
uh, Starmer is not one of the most popular leaders either uh, or when it comes to uh, people who have been in the opposition. In fact, he is doing worse than even the previous prime minister who were in the opposition uh, right before uh, they became the prime minister. And so this clearly shows that there is a significant uh, lack in a, or, you know, there is a significant loss in confidence in the traditional uh, set of politics of, you know, the Tories and the Tory likes. And that is really not giving out any kind of results that really needs to happen. And, you know, you can actually, we have to wait and see uh, later this year how it affects turnout, how it affects results. But definitely the voters are really not given a great deal of options when it comes to uh, choosing a leadership that can actually move the country to the change that they really want. Thank you so much, Anish, for that. That's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back next week with a fresh episode. In the meanwhile, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.